ready for the word this morning. Amen. One, two, there we go. I turned it off. I want that. I want you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7. And just a reminder that um, next, uh, in two weeks, August the 18th, Jeff and Cindy Weber will be with us making their summertime visit and uh, sharing what's going on there and giving us the word. So don't miss that. Our um, emphasis over the past few weeks has been the prophetic word that was spoken over us as a church, which initiated our 40 days of glory and growth, prayer, fasting and prayer time. And I've been following that up with several messages to encourage us to break through in those areas as a church, but also to help us break through into the promises of God in our personal lives. It's not just about the church, but it is about us personally. And this message this morning, I think is probably the most important in this series. In Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 7, it says, Ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who ha asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. And Father, I just thank you for your word, and I just yes. thank you that I am anointed to share the word. I thank you I'll share it in boldness and clarity, and our hearts are open to receive exactly what we're to receive from you today in Jesus' name. Prayer is uh, vital in our personal lives and in, the, in our corporate life as a church. And as I thought about the importance of prayer in our personal lives and in the church, I keep hearing the, the phrase, ask me. Ask me. And uh, I, I sense that God is encouraging me to ask for things, and really not just for me, but to ask him for things for the church. And, and I was directed to this verse, and we've all heard these verses before, but there's a... An interesting aspect of this that I, I, I believe that God wants us to hear this morning. The words ask, seek, and knock here are not passive words. They are present tense words that speak of persistence. In fact, the definition of ask is beg, call for, crave, desire, require. That's what that word ask means. It's not simply asking for something but asking over and over and over and again for it. And we're asking over and over again because we know we have to have what we are asking for in our lives. Now, I'm not talking about some whim where we, where we see something on TV and, you know, it's the, it's the latest and greatest of whatever we already have. And so we want that and we ask for it, whatever. You know, it, it, it's not something that's going to change our life. But I am talking about something that we know uh, that is vital to our lives in order to fulfill our destinies, in order to fulfill the Word of God, in order to be what God has called us to be, we have to have that. Okay? So in the Amplified Bible, I, I like that translation. It says, keep on asking and it will be given you. Keep on seeking and you will find keep on knocking reverently and the door will be open to you for everyone who keeps on asking receives and he who keeps on seeking finds and to him who keeps on knocking it will be open well when we read that translation we think well you know we're a word of faith church is that isn't that wrong aren't we supposed to ask god one time for things and then thank god after that and I believe that there are certain promises in the Word of God we can. We ask God for it. We believe it in our heart. We begin to thank God for that. But I believe that there are also things that it's okay to ask for more. And God is encouraging us to ask for more than once. In fact, God wants us to because it shows where our hearts truly are in regards to Him. Also, these types of, 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 of things involve warfare because the enemy wants to keep them from us. He doesn't want us to have them. So we can call this preserving or persevering prayer. So what is persevering prayer? Well, persevering prayer is asking, seeking, and knocking until the answer is received, found, or open. And it is being so obsessed with getting something that a person never gives up until God responds. Right? So that's the type of asking and seeking and knocking that I'm talking about. So desperately want this that we're not going to stop until God gives it to us, to, until God responds. Right? 
So these words, ask, seek, and knock, are in the present tense. A person is to keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking, and he is to persist in prayer. The words receive, find, and open in the next verse are also in the present tense. So that doesn't mean that it's something that we have to wait for until we get sometime way off in the future, but it's a, I believe it's a constant receiving that we're supposed to have from God at the same time. The very fact that we are asking and seeking and knocking demonstrates that we are truly dependent upon God. I love Jeremiah chapter 33 verses 1 through 3. It says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah a second time while he was still shut up in the court of the priest, saying, Thus says the Lord who made it, the Lord who formed it to establish it, the Lord is his name, call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Uh, God said to Jeremiah, call to me. And, and there are really two meanings to the word call. First, it means to call out passionately and persistently to cry out. But it also means to name a thing. So we call out in faith and declare and decree in faith what we want to receive from God. So we're persistent in our prayer, we're naming what we want to see, and we're also believing that it's going to come to pass. So everybody with me in that? Now, if we do this, it says that God will show us great and mighty things. The word great would mean miraculous things. We can understand great, big, great things, you know. The word mighty actually means previously inaccessible. Call to me, call persistently to me, and I will show you things that were previously inaccessible. Now that could refer to two things. You know, first we can speak of the new things that, that God has for us that for whatever reason we haven't stepped into yet. There are things that were inaccessible to us Maybe it was timing, maybe it was something else, but we haven't experienced them yet. But second, these are things that the enemy is trying to hold back from us, trying to hide and conceal from us. The Amplified Bible says it this way, Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things, fenced in and hidden, which you did not know, do not distinguish and recognize, have knowledge of and understand. So the enemy has them fenced in and he is hindering us from stepping into those things. There are promises on each of our lives, maybe prophetic words that we talked about, that we haven't stepped into yet. They have been previously inaccessible. And part of that is because the enemy does not want us to step into those things. Because when we step into those things, we're going to walk in a new anointing. There's going to be new fruit out of that that is going to be uh, have a greater impact. So he's trying to hold that back. But our prayers, persistent prayers of faith will break through the barriers and bring them into our lives and into our church. Are you ready for that in your life? Amen. I'm ready for that. And I'm ready for God to do that in the church. So God wants to take us into areas of glory and growth that were previously inaccessible to us. Now, just grab hold of that with faith. So I ask, okay, God, you're wanting me to ask and ask and ask. So what am I supposed to, what are we supposed to ask for? And so uh, what are we supposed to cry out? What are we supposed to be persistently asking God for? And, and of course, the teacher in me kicks in. And so I start making this big mental list of all of the things that I want to ask God for. And they're good things and, and, and that I want in, in, in my life. And, 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 and I, you know, I can say, well, this could be a really nice series of teachings, you know, asking God for these things. But I sensed the Lord saying that he wanted us as a church to con concentrate our praying in two areas. I had a challenge with that because all of the things that are in my heart that I want to see are good things. You know, uh, things that, you know, we want to continue to ask God for. We need leaders to rise up in certain areas for certain ministries. We need finances to, to fund the areas of ministry. We need clarity of vision in certain areas. There's a, there's a lot of things that we need as a church that we're praying for and believing for and declaring for us as a church. And as I wrestled with that in my spirit, I kept hearing these same two things that God wanted us to ask him for. And even though there are great things that we want in our lives personally, when we understand one key thing, 
It will bring everything together in our spirits. And this is the thing that we need to know. When we pray for the things in God's heart, He will take care of the things in our hearts. Amen. That's good. Seek you first the kingdom of God. Yes. And His righteousness and other things will be added to us. When we concentrate our life, when we focus our life on the things that are in God's heart, when we make that the priority, then God will be will make sure that we also experience the things that are in our hearts. I have a lot in my heart. I know that God wants me to have all those things that I mentioned earlier, and that's just a little of what's in my heart, but we must focus on His heart first. And as we do, not only will we receive what He wants us, what He wants the most, but we'll also be blessed. So, persistent prayer. Ask and ask and ask and ask and ask and keep on asking. What are the two things? Zechariah chapter 10 verse 1. Ask the Lord for rain in the time of the latter rain. The Lord will make flashing clouds. He will give them showers of rain, grass in the field for everyone. Number one, ask for rain. I just think this is a powerful verse because I believe that we are living in the days that God wants to do something awesome in the, in the earth. And he is doing awesome things in the earth. But God wants to pour out his spirit in ways that he has not done in the past. And, and I want to be a part of it. I, I pray often, God, if you are doing anything in the earth today, I want to be part of it. Amen. I don't want to miss anything that you're doing in the earth today. But just because we are in those days of rain doesn't mean that we're automatically going to receive the rain. You know, the, we have four seasons in Maryland. We have wintertime and everything seems to die and, and it gets cold. And then we have springtime and there's a lot of rain, typically a lot of rain. And, and, and then, you know, everything sprouts back up to life. We have the summertime where, you know, everything is... Is, it is warm and, and hot and sometimes the growth slows a little bit uh, but there's enough usually enough rain during the summer to keep things green and then you have the fall where things start to die down but even in the fall there's there's rains that come in the winter times there's there's snow that comes so there's this watering that takes place in all of those times but just because you're entering into the springtime and just because there's an expe expectation of rain doesn't always mean that it's going to rain there are, there are years where the farmers are crying out and begging God for rain because in the spring it just doesn't seem to be raining the way that it needs to be rained. Or if it does rain, it's like this one big gully wash of six inches that just destroys the fields. And so there's, there's this expectation of rain. And, and I'm just, you know, we're in the days where I believe that God is pouring out His Spirit. There's an expectation of rain and the moving of the Spirit. But just because it is happening doesn't mean it's going to happen in our lives unless we are asking God for it. If we're not persistent in asking Him for something that He wants to do, sometimes we may miss it. Come on. So we have to ask God for rain during the times of rain. So when we're talking about rain, we're speaking about the glory and the presence of God. We want to see God's healing power released in this place on a continual basis. We saw it a couple of weeks ago. A couple of people got healed. But we want that to be a, a, an every Sunday occurrence. We want that to be something that happens every day of our life when we pray for people. We, want, we, we just want the presence of God to fill us. We want to experience the fullness of God, not just for here, but to empower us to go out there. So we ask for God in the time of rain. This is a season, the spirit, uh, uh, and we need God's rain. Seeking and knocking are involved too. We're crying out to God for rain and then our actions become involved. Jeremiah 29 verse 13 says, And you will seek me and find me when, everybody say when. When. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all, all your heart. So that lets me know that there's persistence. If we want to experience God, we have to seek Him with everything that's in us. Yes. It can't be a, a, a second thing. It cannot be something that we just do on Sunday mornings. 
It's got to be the consistent daily inflow and outflow of our life, a seeking after God. Finding God and experiencing His fullness is a result of seeking Him with all of our hearts. That means that we can't be half-hearted about worship. Right. That's right. We have to worship God with all of our hearts. Knocking simply means that we passionately press into the presence of God. We will not be denied. We have to have that type of persistence when we come together. We worship God and we press in and we press in for all that God has for us. We want more of God. I, I, I want people to sense God's presence as soon as they walk into the property. I want this to be a place of healing, deliverance, comfort, peace, everything that God is. I want to be manifest in this place regularly. I want to see the things that were prophesied over us. The floodgates being opened. Uh, believing God for great things, a house of restoration, our feet on healing ground, God putting his focus on this house. I want those things. I don't want church as usual. Amen. I want more and more and more of God. Yes. Are you with me in that? Yes. So first we ask for rain. Why do we ask for rain? Psalm chapter 2 verse 8. Ask me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. We read this verse, we think uh, that we should ask God for us to be victorious over foreign nations. But really, this is speaking of bringing nations under the lordship of Jesus Christ. In fact, we have that command in Matthew 28, which says, go into all the world and, and make disciples of all the nations. It didn't say the people in the nations. So there's really a call upon the church to actually disciple the nation. We are the ones that, that should be setting the culture of a nation. Good. That's good. That's but, but we're not. The church hasn't risen up to that point. So, I believe that the number two thing that God wants us to be persistent in asking for is ask for souls. Amen. Pray persistently for the harvest. When you look at the statistics, it's, it tell, they tell us that the church in the United States is getting smaller. And that's despite certain different revivals that are taking place in the nation. As a church, I could probably count on my fingers how many people have been saved in the past 10 years here. But we are a typical church, worse than some, maybe better than some, I don't know, in this area. And, and I'm not satisfied with that. Amen. It's time for growth. And I, and I want to see that main growth God sends us be new converts. Yes. People coming to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We know there's commands in the word that we are to be witnesses. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the end of the earth. But the Holy Spirit wasn't given to us just so we can speak in tongues. Just so we can have a good church service and experience his presence. That's not, that is a benefit of the Holy Spirit, but that is not the purpose of the Holy Spirit. The purpose of the Holy Spirit is to empower us to be witnesses. Yes. To carry the gospel of Jesus Christ to people that are around us. He said, you shall be my witnesses. He didn't say it was an option. He said, you shall. Mark chapter 1 verse 17 says that Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. The word become there implies that there's work to be done in that area. So what's happening is, is that God is working on us to make us become something that we are not now. All right. He's making us to become something. When Jesus called the disciples, they weren't fishers of men, they were fishers of fish. And he called them, and he, for three and a half years, he poured into them, talking to them about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and then he empowered them to do and to become fishers of men. And we can see the revivals that took place in the book of Acts, and how many people came into the kingdom of God. So... He wants to make us become soul winners. So this involves changing in our thinking, in our seeing, in our hearing, in our actions. So he works on us to make us become something that we have not previously been. 
Proverbs 11.30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. The Amplified says it this way, The fruit of the uncompromisingly righteous is a tree of life, and he who is wise captures human lives for God. As a fisher of men, he gathers and receives them for eternity. The righteous tree bears fruit, and the fruit is not just godly character. Right? We want that kind of fruit in our life. We want the love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, faith, temperance. We want that. But it's not just that. It is winning souls to Jesus Christ. And, it, and, and really, this is a sobering verse. Because it says, we are called wise if we win souls. So what are we called if we don't? Think about this. We are unwise because we have the answer to the world's problems. We are unwise when we have the key to a person's eternal destiny and we let them face hell without telling them. What kind of friend is that? We are unwise when we have a Heavenly Father whose heart is bursting with love for every person on this earth, and we won't introduce those people to a loving Heavenly Father. Amen. That is not wise. No. That is not kind. That's not good. So, I believe that the key to us becoming soul winners is a change of heart. And it's time for us to develop the heart of God for sinners. It's a love so strong that caused him to leave heaven, come to earth, take upon himself the skin of man, and then die a horrible, cruel death so that he could pay the price for all of our sins. That's the love of God. And we have plenty of room in this building for growth, and it's time to fill this place up with people. So as fishers and men, it's important to us to understand, too, that we're not in a catch-and-release program. This is not some kind of tournament. And what I mean by that is, you know, a lot of times we just want to lead somebody in sinner's prayer and just leave them alone and feel like we've done something. That's like having a baby and then just leaving them out in the street. Come on. Jesus didn't say make converts. He said make disciples. Right, that's right. Now I believe that there will be times where we're in a place, on a trip, in an airplane, where we share with somebody and you know we cannot follow up with that person you know, because we're just not in the localities. We can maybe get a phone number and try to connect them with the church somehow. But in our everyday lives, our job is not just to lead somebody in the sinner's prayer. It's to capture them and disciple them. Yes. And we do that together. What, what I love about the body of Christ is sometimes you can witness to somebody and you can have nothing, absolutely nothing in common with that person. And you can witness to them and you can uh, uh, share the love of Jesus. They accept Christ. They come to church. And then you introduce them to somebody that has the same interest. Yes. And you develop a connection which then leads to discipling. So that's where the body works together in that area. We capture souls. The re reason we're not full today is because winning the lost to Jesus has not become a passionate, prayerful pursuit of ours. But it has to be, and God is calling us to that. And I'm not pointing fingers at you. I'm speaking to a congregation and leaders alike. We're not doing what God has called us to do. We're missing it. We're coming up so short in this area. So we ask God for souls. Then seeking and knocking are involved as well. Luke 19.10 says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus constantly sought out sinners to save. We look for people that God will direct us to to share with. 
some of us are so surrounded by Christians, and I am in this position, that we hardly know any lost people. Now we enjoy that because we all believe the same, we get to enjoy each other's company, we get to talk about the same things, but we're not having any kind of worldly impact. So maybe we need to make some new friends. You with me? Yes. Seeking, looking, and then knocking simply means we take advantage of every opportunity. How many times has God shown us somebody that we're supposed to talk to and we didn't do it? Come on. How many times? There's always fear involved. I, I, I know that. What if they reject it? What if they don't? Right. But what if they do reject it? What difference does it make? At least they know now. Right. And you did what God called you to do. All we can do is share and it's up to God to do the rest of it. Yes. You know, we can't save anybody, but we sure can share the gospel with somebody and let them know about Jesus. Several things are going to happen when we ask for souls. First, we're going to develop a greater heart for the people that are around us and be more open to opportunities to share the gospel. I think sometimes churches wait for evangelistic events. We've got to have some kind of event before we can witness, but God just wants this to be an everyday, easy thing that we do. And the more we pray for the lost, the more that there's going to be a love for the lost in their hearts because we're going to just capture God's heart for the lost. Right now, we, I'll be honest, some of us may not care about that right now. But if we begin to persistently pray for the lost, and in that whole process, just say, God, change my heart so I love the lost. Sometimes we just don't want to be around lost people because they're just so different than us. But just say, God, change my heart so that, I, that I'm, I'm just being open to sharing with someone. I am asking God for opportunities to share the gospel with others. I am frustrated with fruitlessness in my life in that area. I'm tired of it. I want things to change. And I'm asking God to give me souls, and I hope you are as well, because that is part of my morning prayer every day. That God, give me somebody to talk to. When I'm mowing the grass, I'm listening to music, but I'm also praying for all my neighbors that are around by name. And there are a couple of them that I don't know their names, but I pray hard for them, especially the one right next to us. With what goes on over there. The smells we smell. The yelling in the language we hear. The chainsaw cutting down eight to ten trees in one fell swoop as the guy is mad at his wife for some reason. They're still laying in the yard. As you drive by, even 136, you'll see him. Made for a nice memorial, Memorial Day. Second, prayer will prepare the way for the Word of God to enter their hearts. We're going to see more fruit from our sharing. Uh, pray for your neighbors, those you work with, those you go to school with, and then as you pray for them, I believe that there are going to be open doors that God will give us to speak into their life. And, and I think part of that is maybe the doors were open before, but now because we're praying for them, we are looking now for those opportunities. We're listening for the voice of the Holy Spirit. And then because of that, those, those doors are open and then we can step into them. People have challenges. They have needs. And sometimes if there's a death or if there's an illness or something like that, their hearts, that's a, a period of time that their hearts are open to receive something from God. They're looking for something and you can step right in and share the love of Jesus with them. Amen. And don't limit your alertness to just the people that you are praying for. But I just think the more we pray for the people that we know, 
There's going to be open doors for them, but we're also going to become so sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit and the leadership of the Holy Spirit, He's going to point out people that we don't even know that we can share with. Third, the power of the enemy is going to be weakened and he will not be able to keep people from accepting Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 tells us that the enemy has blinded people's minds to the light of the glorious gospel. And we are commanded to pray so that that cloud is removed so that the light of the glorious gospel can shine through. And so our persistent prayer deals with that cloud and opens up for them to see the light. And number four, we're going to see a greater inflow of souls. Our church will become attractive to sinners, and they won't know why. It's because we've developed such a love for them that when they walk in the door, they're just going to feel. They're just going to be I don't, I, overwhelmed in a good sense by the love Amen. of Jesus and the love of people. So two things. Ask God for rain. Ask God for souls. And listen, praying for rain is not a selfish thing. It's, it's not just for us. We're praying for souls. So we want to experience the presence of God in here. We want people with, you don't know what people are dealing with sometimes. You don't know what they're going to walk through the door carrying. And we want them to be met and ministered to yeah, and that. set free yeah. by the power and the presence yeah. of God. Yeah. You know, I don't want them just to come and see how good the worship band is or how excellent our ushers are or how friendly our greeters are or how excellent our youth and children's ministry is or how good the food is in Koinonia Cafe or, or, or how clean the church is or how good or not my sermon is every week. I want them to experience the presence yes. from God. Amen. Zechariah 10, 1, back to that verse, Ask the Lord for rain in the spring, and he will give it. It is the Lord who makes storm clouds that drops showers of rain so that every field becomes a lush pasture. Hallelujah. We not only want souls, we want an atmosphere where they can encounter the presence of God, and not just for them, but ourselves as well. We yes. want this place to be a lush pasture of God's presence. Amen. Pasture. I could be a lush pasture. <laughs> Pray. Pray hard. Yes. Worship. Worship hard. Ask God for rain. And listen, I'm not putting God in a box about what the rain is supposed to look like. I'm not seeking manifestations. I'm just seeking His presence. Amen. So we're not copying anybody. We just want the rain. And then we need to pray hard and worship hard and just believe God for souls in our life. Give us the harvest, Lord. I, I want to lead people to Jesus. My prayer is, God, help me share your love with others. We pray for rain, more rain, Lord, and we pray for souls. And so my challenge to us this morning is make those two our prayer focus every day. Will you, will you do that with me? Yes. Amen.